I'm Benjamin Sovacool, Professor of Energy Policy at the University of Sussex in the UK and Director of the Center on Innovation and Energy Demand. And I'm here to talk today about some of the social and behavioral dimensions to energy use in developing countries, especially as they relate to Sustainable Development Goal number seven. So for those of you that are reading through the Sustainable Development Goal number seven, you may notice something kind of curious. There's a bunch of bullet points under the main goal. And two of them relate to things most of us probably are familiar with, energy efficiency and then renewable energy, wind farms and, and solar panels and such. But there's a curious one that comes at the top, and that's uh, universal energy access. And universal energy access may be odd, some think, because energy is something we take you know, quite for granted in most countries. It's ubiquitous. It's always there. We want to flip a switch. Our wireless internet works. We want to see a movie. We go to the cinema. But in many parts of the world, the energy systems aren't developed enough to provide that level of lifestyle. And you might be quite shocked to realize that something like 1.6 billion people around the world have no access to electricity. And more than twice that depend on wood or coal or solid fuels for cooking, which means they've never used a gas stove, they've never seen a microwave. It also means that many of those people have lifestyles that ha have basically none of the privileges that you and I uh, watching this video might be used to. And so these lives with no internet, no email, no hot water, no modern amenities, no medical health care, uh, no access to cars are very, very different. And that's why I think this goal of universal energy access might be the most important of them all, because it's about creating a future energy system that is not just sustainable, but also equitable and just. First of all, it's often a mistake to think about energy access around the world as only an energy issue. There's a lot of compelling evidence to suggest it's also an issue of gender parity and it's an issue of health. And that's because there is an extremely gendered dimension to energy use. In developing countries, eight out of 10 activities are performed by women, usually with children, sometimes with children strapped to their back. It's women who are spending 40 hours a week in many countries searching for firewood. It is women who spend four to five hours a day actually cooking food, and it is usually women who are doing chores and housekeeping. And they will pull their children out of school sometimes to help with that, which also gets into issues of education, et cetera. That also means that it is women who are the first to suffer what has been called indoor air pollution. And indoor air pollution coming mostly from cook stoves, from traditional ways of cooking, uh, is actually now a leading cause of death. So there's this famous study that's done in The Lancet uh, about two years ago that looked at how humanity dies. What depressing reading, right? It's called the Global Burden of Disease Study. And it tracks using different metrics, morbidity and mortality by cause and by region. And what's quite shocking is that indoor air pollution from cook stoves is number four in the world for what kills you. It is higher than unsafe sex. It is higher than illegal narcotics. It is higher than obesity. It is higher than alcoholism. It is higher than malaria and tuberculosis. And it is almost equivalent to HIV AIDS. So when we talk about energy use, uh, we're not always talking only about cost. We're also talking about health. And I think the most recent numbers anticipate about 4.3 million deaths per year, premature deaths. And these aren't just 85-year-old people who die at the age of 80. These are mostly children under the age of five and women under the age of 40. So energy use in the developing world can quite literally kill you. It's been described as something like smoking a thousand cigarettes a day in a confined open space. Uh, which also means that energy access interventions have huge health benefits and huge gender benefits that we often don't think about and we don't calculate in the same way when we think about energy prices. When you talk about achieving universal energy access, it's important to break it down by energy services. And so things like electricity do some things like lighting, education, entertainment, and things like cooking and heating are for other types of services. So each set of technologies provides those different services. And so let's start with electricity. The International Energy Agency thinks that there are three separate classes of technological systems that can provide energy access. The first one is the grid, which most of us are familiar with because we have reliable grid access at home. The second one is the opposite. It's off-grid systems, isolated systems that are at your home or maybe a few homes together in a neighborhood. These are things like uh, solar home systems, microhydro dams, uh, biogas digesters, really, really small-scale Pico wind turbines that are about the size of a laptop computer. However, there's a third option that's often missed, and that's a kind of middle-scale option that are called microgrids or mini-grids. 
And in their projections about universal electricity access by 2030, the International Energy Agency thinks that it's actually all three of those technologies play almost an equal role. They think that the grid will account for about a third of new connections to sustainable energy systems. About a third will tend to be microgrids and mini grids. Uh, and then about a third will be these, is these isolated kind of off-grid household systems. And what you can already start to see is each of these three systems has different marketing profiles, different technological requirements, different investment return ratios, et cetera. And so it's kind of like you have three separate market segments with three separate technological systems operating at the same time. And one of the challenges is that these systems can cannibalize market demand for each other. A home that just paid $1,000 for a really big solar home system isn't going to want to then pay for a grid connection and vice versa. And there's been some challenges too when politicians will say they're going to extend the grid during an election campaign and then they don't. And then the communities didn't invest in microgrids or off-grid systems because they thought, oh, the grid is coming. But by and large, I think you can treat all three of those options as kind of distinct and all of them have equally important roles to play for electricity. For cooking, you're actually dealing with much simpler technologies. Cleaner cook stoves or improved cook stoves. We've moved away from using the word improved because all, all the people selling stoves said they were improved even if they weren't. And so the World Health Organization has some guidelines now about in terms of pollution and heat ratios uh, and quality of cooking. Uh, systems have to meet before they can be classified as clean. But basically you're dealing with stoves. Uh, stoves that have chimneys, stoves that are made of better materials, some stoves that may use a small amount of electricity to actually start the combustion process, and stoves that just cook a lot more efficiently. Uh, and so those types of devices cost sometimes eight, ten, fifteen dollars. They're very cheap. Unlike a solar home system, which is a hundred dollars, a micro hydro dam, which is twenty thousand dollars, a microgrid, which is two hundred thousand dollars, or a grid, which is two billion dollars. So you can already see that the turnover for cook stoves and cleaner forms of cooking could be much faster than these other capital intensive things like the grid. So I think legitimately, given the health concerns and the great disparity in access to cleaner forms of cooking, like I said, twice as many people depend on, on healthy forms of cooking than lack electricity access. There's been a huge push in the engineering and technical community to make better cook stoves. And there are communities now in India and China, there's the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, which is an NGO based in the United States, that have set their mission at disseminating these cleaner systems. And there are all sorts of new standards and designs, the rocket stove, gasified stoves, tag stoves, et cetera, that have started to kind of hit the market. But I think one drawback to these types of approaches is they continue to take predominantly a technical or economic approach. Oh, if we just make the best efficient stove, or if we get its price below a certain threshold, then voila, we have universal adoption. And what they found in the past five years is it's not that simple. There are all sorts of social, cultural, political barriers that can stop these types of systems from being used. So I think one of the challenges with sustainable energy goal number seven, given its sub goals, is, is that all, all of them do matter. I mean, I think there's a strong case that universal energy access should come first, but the others, efficiency and renewables, also matter because we have to decarbonize and green existing grids, not only new ones. And while there's a large fraction of humanity that doesn't have access, there's an even larger fraction that does, right, and can use to use energy in unsustainable ways. So you can already see it's starting to get quite complicated. We have different sets of options for energy access, then we have a whole different set of options for efficiency and a whole different set of options for renewables. And I think when you put all of those permutations together, the unfortunate lesson is that no single country will have the same energy profile, even countries that are very similar, like Canada and the US, or Vanuatu and Fiji. Each one will be different. And to illustrate this, the United Nations Development Program two years ago put together a report on energy access and they tried to develop what they've called the energy access cost curve. And they chose the small island of Vanuatu, which is in the Pacific. And they chose Vanuatu because it was very simple, had a smaller grid, and it was much easier to do the calculations. And that graph is really nice. It shows you that they think that they could reach about 19,000 people per year from energy access efforts but they arrayed them into three different types of systems, the grid-connected systems, the microgrid systems, and the off-grid systems. And they also divided them based on both potential, how many people could they serve, and cost, how much do they serve people at an additional marginal cost. And what you can see going from left to right is that the mix is very unique. It's things like cook stoves and wood lots that come first, so you could have more efficient harvesting of wood and more efficient use of it in the home. Then it moves to things like solar energy or microgrids, 
even candles, better longer lasting candles. And then at the far right you have things like kerosene and the national grid being extended and some more expensive things like micro hydro dams. And what's interesting is I think in that graph are more than 20 options. And this is just a small, small country of a few thousand people with I think less than 20 megawatts of capacity. That's not enough capacity to even serve the University of Oxford. And so if you start to magnify the challenge to be beyond Vanuatu, you can start to see that the options maybe jump from 20 to 40 to 50, and you can also see that their cost, their potential, all of those things will also change based on the environment. And so I think it's a nice job of illustrating that there is no silver bullet. I guess the solution is more like silver buckshot, where you know it's a contextually specific type of energy access solution for each country. I think that things like renewable energy systems and energy efficiency also have a very important role to play in not just only achieving sustainable development goals, but also in just achieving sustainability even for fully industrialized countries. Renewable energy already as of 2015 in many countries offers the least cost source of electricity. So in the United States, wind energy is already cheaper than new gas or coal or new nuclear. And so is landfill gas capture. In India, small hydropower is at the moment one of the cheapest forms of electricity that you can get. Uh, in places like the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, it's solar energy because there's a heck of a lot of sunlight. As well as in a lot of urban areas, you have solar photovoltaic systems reaching what's called grid parity. They provide electricity cheaper than you can actually buy it uh, from the actual commercial electricity grid. And there are places like San Diego all the way over to Copenhagen where you have grid parity that's reached. And so it's kind of a mistake at the one hand to think that, oh, Investing in renewables is going to be investing in more costly, expensive technologies. That's completely false. In many, many markets around the world, there are already some of the cheapest forms of electricity today. And that's without even monetizing many of the other benefits they get you, like less carbon emissions, improved energy security, more local jobs, diversification of supply, etc. So I think that renewables uh, have a front and center role to play going forward. But I also think that energy efficiency matters. And this too does a number of things. If you have more efficient energy systems, your energy access goals are easier to meet because each system delivers more energy. And your renewable energy systems are easier to integrate because your national energy profiles become more resilient. Energy efficiency, one of my colleagues once said, is like a free lunch you get paid to eat. If you do it right, it accumulates its savings over time. And it also tends to be cheaper than any type of supply side option because building a power plant takes years and is very expensive and has fuel and maintenance costs, etc. Energy efficiency can be as simple as putting a new window in your house. You can do that in a day, right? Or maybe changing the way that you wash your clothes from hot water to cold water. That takes you two minutes, right, to set the different setting. So the turnover and the ability for efficiency options to kind of capture savings and improvements in sustainability is usually on the time scale of minutes, hours, and days, rather than decades, which is what it takes to build new power plants. And so I think that both of those two systems, energy efficiency and renewables, can really complement energy access efforts, which is why I suspect they're part of this kind of integrated goal. So I think one easy mistake uh, many policymakers and planners make when they view energy problems like energy access or renewables is to think in solutions in terms of top-down approaches. Economists often call these commanded control solutions because usually they specify what technologies to use, what targets to meet, sometimes even what cost you know, such targets should be achieved at. And as you can probably guess, the type of rigid control may work well in the military, but it doesn't work very well in the real world outside where you're dealing with you know, complex dynamic systems that aren't easily modeled and predicted. So to handle these types of pesky problems, there's been research done by the late Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics a few years ago. And what she said is that when you address social problems, don't do it top down alone. Do it through polycentrism or polycentric systems. So the government addressing a problem with a policy is monocentric. One actor at one scale addressing one problem. Polycentrism, as you can probably guess, means mixing the scales and mixing the actors. So usually you have two, five, 10, even 20 different actors at different levels. The household, the community, the city, the region, the state, maybe uh, the country and then the globe. And when you talk about energy or climate, these are problems that are really well attuned to polycentrism because the problems themselves transcend actors and scales. 
And so what she said in some of her latest research before she died was that if you're going to do energy access problems, if you're going to provide more sustainable food and water, electricity, agriculture, etc., you have to do it through polycentric approaches. And that means you have to have broad coalitions of stakeholders that are involved. And it also means that you can't treat them all as passive consumers. You have to also treat them as active energy users. That means now households become not just recipients of energy, they become stewards of sustainability or active producers of energy uh, that are also responsible for more of the system. And as you can imagine, such polycentric thinking, because it's more inclusive and accountable, can often be more effective in terms of cost, in terms of achieving targets, but it also erodes the business markets of conventional energy companies because they're giving up domain and control over the energy system. As one electric utility chairperson said a few years ago, it's like new customers, no sales, because they're all producing their own energy. Uh, but I think Eleanor was on to something in that these types of polycentric approaches may be more lasting, durable, uh, and effective than our kind of old school government approaches which we've been relying on for the past few hundred years. What does all of this mean for sustainable energy goal number seven? I think if there's one lesson it is we have to reframe it. Is there a legitimate role for engineering and science and economics? Yes, of course, and we should continue to build and design better energy systems that are cleaner, cheaper, more sustainable, et cetera, especially better cook stoves and better renewable sources of energy. We need to be concerned about the affordability of energy services for the poor and vulnerable, but that's only a piece of the puzzle. I think we also have to think about how this issue is also an issue of politics, an issue of justice, an issue of social lifestyles and preferences and behavior. And I think in that regard, it means reframing the issue so that we don't just see some atmospheric scientist in a lab coat talking about the climate change impacts of energy access and insecurity. We uh, don't just see an economist talking about price profiles and markets. We also see a grandmother talking about how it's an issue of equity for her grandchildren and future generations. We see mothers talking about how it's an issue of fairness to their children who are choking down soot and fumes every day. Uh, it's an issue of politics for the disenfranchised and marginalized, for indigenous people, for others who've been relocated for energy projects. Uh, and it's also an issue about what type of society we want in the future, an issue of choice and lifestyle and psychology. It's not just about science and technology and engineering, it's about everything else. Society, morality, ethics, politics, this is all an energy access problem.